Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of BitNote. For today's episode, we'll be talking about music from games that were never actually quite released. Have a listen. So, I've played music from a lot of different games on this show, and um, most of them have one thing in common. They were actually released. Now, games are like a lot of other creative media. There's a lot of stuff that's released and people get it and play it and maybe some do and some don't and everything. But there's also a lot of games that never actually make it to release. They're never actually released for people to buy or or play or whatever. And it's actually pretty common. I mean, how often times have you heard about like some film that was canned or something... Thing, great work of art that was remained unfinished. And video games are sus- especially susceptible. <clears throat> Even a decent video game can take several months of development. It might take a team of anything from 5 to 70 people. And it can just, it'll, it can take a long time and, and more importantly, a lot of money. Whether you're a big publisher and you've got a huge, and you've got a huge amount of people to uh, keep on the payroll and so you're costing he- like thousands each month, or even you're just a small company but you're still bootstrapping yourself and funding. Money is often one main reason that you're, that you're basically might run out of money before you finish. Or in main publishers, simply fact is you've realized that this game is never actually going to make more money than make enough money to justify its expense. So it's cheaper to cancel it now. Or at least that's what they think, but it's not true. Fortunately, just because a game is never actually released doesn't mean that that we don't get absolutely anything of it. Especially games, especially a lot of games, there's a lot of publicity, a lot of stuff is released early, which is how we know a lot of games are actually, were actually created and were going, and we've got a lot of assets, even though we never actually got to play them. I'd like to give a shout out to two websites, uh, Unseen64 and Lost Worlds. They're two websites that dedicate themselves to talking and detailing games that were never actually made it to release. So, um... I think it just shows there's a lot of people out there who really do care about games that never quite make it. So to start off with, I think I'll start with a game called, which which I kind of like, called Agartha. It was about in 2001. It was developed by No Cliché Studio, which used to be Delphine Software. And long story short is it was a horror game, somewhat in the vein of uh, Alone in the Dark, which the uh, composer also worked on. And essentially, it was kind of like a, set in a Romanian snow-cast village where basically an ancient evil was awaking. And you were playing a guy called Kirk, who was like this great guy with a big white beard who some game magazines called like a Sean Connery lookalike. And obviously, the older Sean Connery, not the younger one. And before I talk any more, I bet I think I'll play some of the music by the game's composer Philip Vacci, who thankfully put his some his music up online for people to listen to recently. I'll start off with uh, a song called Bodnath, and uh, then I'll talk a bit more about the game before moving on. I hope you enjoy.
And that was Bodnath from the unreleased game Agaratha by No Cliché, and it was composed by Philippe Bacci. Um, a lot of the reason that that game was never actually released was because, well, No Cliché ended up being a wholly owned subsidiary of Sega, and they published great games. Before that, they made games like The Little Big Adventure and Little Big Adventure 2 and Time Commando, which were all very well received. It was a French company. Then it was bought by Sega, and it made the great and very much fun Toy Commander, where you controlled a bunch of toys as they went around and staged a rebellion against the Masters and stuff. And, um, well, actually, we're finding the rebellion. Some, not all toys were on the side but um, and essentially um, they made Argatha which was going to be very atmospheric had great graphics for the time and um, basically you had this hero who could either like help save all the people or, or help unleash the evil and dealing with cults and this weird sickness in this very snowy atmospheric Romanian village and unfortunately in 2001 Sega said sorry we're not going to keep making the Dreamcast we're going to go platform agnostic the Dreamcast went down and no cliche had to cancel the game so pity about that the game was really seemed to have potential and Philippe as he said very haunting score but such is the way that things go unfortunately so I'm moving on to another title now and in this case actually it's one of those strange titles where it seems that the uh, music is actually pretty popular from the game and that's because the music was by Chris Huesbeck Chris Holzbeck. Now, I've talked about Chris on the show before, played some of the great music from a game called Turrican 2. And, of course, uh, Turrican was one of those classic uh, 2D games where you're, you're kind of in a suit of uh, space armor and fighting these aliens and kind of somewhat surreal graphics, but you're fighting everything. <clears throat> and it had quite a couple of good games, uh, Turrican 1, Turrican 2, and there were a couple of other things like Mega Turrican and stuff. But they were all 2D games, platformers, very much action, very fondly regarded. But, of course, in the mid-90s, what did most happen to most 2D games? Yep, they had to go 3D. And boy, this was a gauntlet that many games either tripped over and fell flat on their face in, or also, or otherwise found, managed to find some way to go. Remember, back then the idea of a 3D game was completely new. Probably what most people imagined it as was some 3D movie or something. And to be honest, I always felt that ideas didn't translate quite as well to 3D unless you really knew what you were doing. But the question is, did, did the Turrican series ever make it to 3D? Well, no. I, Essentially what happened is the rights kind of got split into two, so they ended up getting two separate games, Turrican 3D and another game called Tornado. Uh, Tornado was originally planned for the Nintendo 64 and then the GameCube, but both games ended up just not being released. Why exactly that happened? It, it, these things kind of just happen. A team goes on and it just doesn't quite work out. But um, while well, that's kind of sad, and while we got the few screenshots and a little article here and there from development, what we do have is still the music that Chris Hughesbeck composed for Tornado. And I think that's great. I was listening to it quite a while back when I first came across it, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy it too. Um, obviously from an unreleased game, but hey, if we've got Chris, if we've got Chris Hughesbeck music out of it, I think we all come out for the better. And besides... We never quite know exactly how that game would have worked out in the end, but have a listen.
And that was music from the unreleased Tornado game, and it was composed by Chris Hulsbeck. Well, I've been talking a fair bit about um, unreleased video games, and um, I think that um, one there, people actually forget that there's actually Ireland has had its own unreleased game. But before I get to that, I just want to quickly divert and talk about one unreleased, probably the most famous unreleased game, which actually finally ended up did getting released. We're talking about Pen and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors, which is developed by Imagineering and is one of their last games. They previously developed a lot of other cool games and such. Pen and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors obviously was made by the uh, musician called Pen and Te- uh, sorry the uh, magicians Pen and Teller, and um, it can contains sort of a mini game collection often they had often with their own little smart little clever idea to them such as for instance one of them was a nice platform game and it had an impossible mode where literally you would get defeated as soon as you started the game and there were also um parodies of Siegfried and Roy and all this sort of stuff but um the game also contained what, what Penn and Teller were kind of doing as a bit of a somewhat of a bit of a parody joke game and something also about political satire it was called desert bus you see at the time a lot of people had been saying about how games were too violent and too unrealistic and stuff so Penn and teller decided to develop a game that would be a vermicillitude simulator that would be so real that it would just ha- be stupefyingly real and so they came up with desert bus the idea is that you drove a desert bus from tuscan arizona to las vegas nevada So that sounds kind of okay, right? Well, no. The game takes place in real time and a real distance. So you're driving a desert bus along a desert road at a maximum speed of 45 miles an hour. You can hold down the accelerator and the needle will just about get up. And then you've got to hold it there for about eight hours. Literally, you just, you'd be driving and you'll see it going by. And then sometimes you'll see a little thing on the side of the road and just gently pass you by and it'll keep going and then you hear the sound of the bus in the background and you look at the dials because you're not sure and then the bus will slightly tilt to the right so you got to push back to the left a little and keep doing that because it never stops doing that and you just see the road as it stretches out into the distance and it's like ugh. that continues on and on it time starts to cease you just all you're doing is driving that bus driving that bus and um yeah, and when you finally, finally get there, which I had never actually done because staying 10 hours driving a bus down a desert road is kind of a thing of endurance. When you get down and finally reach your destination, you get a single point. A point. And then you have to drive back in the opposite direction for another eight hours. And then you get another point. And then you have to go. And you can't just put something down in the control key because the bus swerves to the right, so it just won't work. So you've just got to keep at it, keep driving in that direction. That is Desert Bus. Now, to be honest, that sort of game has kind of an allure for the gamer because it's, it is a test, it is a challenge, but it's one more of endurance, patience, and just ability to deal with boredom than anything else. And I've played a bit, and it can be a bit even hypnotic at times just going along with it. But um, fortunately, it's one of the few games to spawn something a lot bigger. Um, a, a while back, uh, a comedy you know, gaming sk- online sketch group called Loading Ready Run decided to do a, a charity a charity fundraiser where they would play Desert Bus and for the more money got, they added another hour to it. And um, it turned out to be a huge success and they went on for next year and next year. I think we're on the seventh Dirty Desert Bus for Hope game where they'll just get into the room, they'll take turns with the, with the console and they'll just have a webcam that'll stream everything. And it's just an amazing way that this game has ended up just becoming so popular, both for this game and just as an endurance thing. So popular, in fact, that it has now been released on the app market. So now you can, if you want, if you have a Google or if you have an Android or iPhone device, you can now partake in the joy that is Desert Bus about driving a bus down a desert for eight hours and then eight hours on the way back. And then you can drive back and see how many points you get because that's the game all about seeing how many points you can get. Okay, um, I think that it's time, now that I've talked about it, now there was a bit of music, but I had a bit of difficulty getting the, to it, but I think it's time to move on to our last game. And this is kind of sad, because this is an unreleased game, but it is from Ireland. Yes, it's Irish, it's from our own country. It is from the game called Kapuki Games, an Irish game developer that was once a great hope that went from 2000 to 2006. They made some online um, Celtic mythology themed games. They made a bunch of mobile themed games, but they went through some tough times. Um, 
one stage they one stage at uh, one year their one of their titles was dropped from the portal their online game drops was to, uh, a lot of their games wouldn't quite get released and then they made a deal with Microsoft for salvation they were going to get funding and then Microsoft suddenly had a reshuffle and then suddenly they were dealing with a guy who wasn't they hadn't dealt with before and the game was dropped I don't like any sort of bureaucracy or Microsoft but that didn't help the game I'm going to talk about was actually a game that I actually played it was called Big Top I mean, what, before I talk a bit more, I think I'm just going to play some music from that game. Okay, and that was from um, Big Top by Kabuki, which was never actually released, but I fortunately got to play it. It was one of their last games before they completely went bankrupt in 2006, and the reason that I managed to get to play it was because I signed up for the beta, and if you know anything about game development, a beta is when a game is near finished, but it's still got a lot of problems with it, so they let other people who may not necessarily be in the game company to try it out and give their feedback. So they had an open beta, I signed up, I downloaded the game, I played it, and it was a very nice little simulator. Basically, you were like a clown in this ring of a circus, you had to set up all these stunts, like, you know, a tight rope and like seesaw axe and stuff, put them in sequence, and then you started the game and your cloud would run towards the first one, perform on it, you know, go to the next one, and the next one and involve one, you know, you could like set up like a cannon that would shoot him through a ring a fire and you'd have to like make sure how far the ring was for the cannon because the further away it was the more like harder the actual challenge is when you do it so the more likely you are to screw up the act so it was actually you know it was actually kind of a fun game i thought it could be improved in a few areas so i like wrote out my thoughts out and gave it to them they said thanks for the ideas we'll consider them you know i felt more interactive but um it was essentially a, a fun little game and uh, unfortunately kabuki went went belly up after that so um it never actually got released and that's kind of a pity um i actually i'm gonna put my hands up now i don't actually know who did the music for this i'm gonna have to double check and hopefully i'll have that for you for the next show but um essentially it was um kapuki um but it was it was just a great chance to play the game and uh, it's kind of a pity the game was never released the reason kapuki never quite made it it was a mix of reasons but basically i think the whole thing was that Many of them were just going forward on enthusiasm and everything, and that's great. It took them six years, and they had a lot of good in- investors, but they just didn't know enough about it. And that's something that's very easy to do. The game industry is very brutal, very harsh. Just because you make a really nice game that you think you like doesn't mean doesn't necessarily mean it's going to actually make money. Because making a game you like and making money and a game that makes money are unfortunately two different things. Although, as Bitsmith once guy from Bitsman one pointed out it's better to make a game you enjoy because you know if the game goes belly up at the end at least you are happy of what you made all right um boy i feel like i completely you know i shouldn't really moralize about kapuki they worked in it for six years that is a heck to go through they worked the late hours the enthusiasm the adrenal things the rush the everything that is something that a lot of game that is underappreciated and damn it 
you guys did a brilliant job in just pushing through and trying getting everything you did. And what you and what you made a big top was great. And I wish you the best of luck in whatever you're doing right now because damn. And I will. So um, I think I'm going to finish up with uh, some background music from the game. This is the music that played whenever you were walking around trying to construct your set of acts for uh, the performance. So uh, this is David Collins with Pit Note. Thank you for listening.